Well, good morning. Happy Sunday to all of you. I'm thrilled we're getting to spend a little time together today. Just a reminder, the easiest way to stay up to date on what's happening at Calvary Assembly is to stay connected on social media. So Facebook, Instagram, our website, those are all ways to make sure that you know what we're doing and when we're doing it. And uh, today we're uh, online again. Uh, if you're watching this live, uh, welcome. I'm thrilled that you're part of our service today. And this actually can be an interactive experience. Uh, you, there are ways for you to participate. When you log on, you can say good morning uh, to those who are already on. You can, you can comment, you can ask questions. Like This is an opportunity for this to be something other than just something I'm watching on screen. We can make this interactive. And I, I do want to say Happy Father's Day. Uh, for all you dads, I appreciate the sacrifices you make, the work that you do, the, uh, the way you demonstrate your devotion, your loyalty, your commitment, your love to your family. Uh, it makes a difference. I know you don't always feel like it does, but uh, I can tell you it really does, and I'm grateful for that. Today, we're continuing our series in the short stories, The Parables of Jesus, and we're going to talk about a one of his lesser known parables. This one doesn't get as much air time when, when the parables are being covered. And it's the story of children at play, playing children. And we're in Luke chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 31. It says, Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Jesus was remarkable in that he was crystal clear and laser focused on his mission. He knew why he was here and what he was supposed to be doing. And a person who has that kind of clarity on mission, who understands their purpose, uh, that provides a lot of freedom. Freedom to be able to say no to things that aren't part of your purpose and to say yes to things that are. I wonder sometimes if our confusion and maybe some difficulty in knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to is because we aren't sure why we are here. If we don't know the why, it's really hard to figure out the what. And so this parable really speaks to this. Now, maybe you're someone who toys or plays with video games, and uh, if you've done that, you know that your player or your character has to go through a series of events to upgrade their capacity, their strength, the number of lives, or to get extra tools. And, and along the way, there's going to be lots of opposition and opportunity, and there's going to be challenges that have to be gone through, and there's going to be hints about where to find things or what to do next if you know where to look. There are risks that have to be taken by the character. And those risks, even in failure, teach you really valuable lessons. And winning feels like a real sense of accomplishment. So my question is, why do we take our avatars in a video game more seriously than we take our real life? It's amazing how much time we'll devote to building our character in a virtual world and miss the opportunity to build our character in the very real world. God wants you to experience a life that is full and a sense that what you do matters. Let me say that again. God wants you to experience a life that is full and a sense that what you do matters. He knows that we actually manage life better when we have a purpose. That purpose needs to be real, but when we have that purpose, we put in real effort and we're willing to take real risk. Without purpose, we tend to pretend a lot, we doubt more, and we quit often. Let me say that again. Without purpose, we tend to pretend a lot, we doubt more, and we quit often. Now, this story is in the context 
of an ongoing conversation that Jesus was having with a group of people who were known for being very serious about their religious beliefs. They were Pharisees. And if you ask them what their purpose was in life, they would tell you the purpose of life is to keep the rules of God. The purpose of life is to keep the rules. Now, if you've ever played any kind of a sport, or you've ever been involved in any kind of a game, there's always a set of rules. There's rules in checkers, there's rules in chess, there's rules in basketball and baseball, lots of rules in baseball, rules in soccer, all these rules. But everyone knows that the rules of the game is not the purpose. It just helps us understand what our options are and, and what's allowable as we pursue our purpose. And so, uh, they were very uncomfortable. These religious leaders were quite uncomfortable being around people who had a purpose other than rule keeping. It made them anxious because their purpose was keeping rules. So John, the baptizer, and Jesus, the Messiah, they were people who had very clear purpose, no ambiguity, and it was not just about rules. And these very religious Pharisees who were all about the rules found a lot of reasons to reject these two individuals. Now, Jesus knew what was going on. He understood their resistance to him and to John, and he also understood what was at the root of it, and that's why he tells this story about children playing. So children love to play in every generation, in every culture. And there's two games that Jesus had observed children playing when they were together, and one was they were playing wedding. They were pretending that someone was getting married. Uh, they wanted to have a party atmosphere. They wanted to have some fun music. Uh, if you've ever seen a Jewish wedding, there, there's a lot of uh, um, involvement in blessing and singing and making promises, and it's so much fun. And so some of the children just, let's play wedding. And then other children wanted to play funeral. And you might be worried about those children, but they're actually, it's, there's nothing to worry about. If you ever think about what actually goes on in a funeral from a child's perspective, uh, it's rather remarkable it's that people get together and they share the memories of someone that they love deeply. And they open up their memory box and they share. And you hear stories you may not have heard for a long time, if at all. And then you see the kind of love that people have for each other. It's a, it's a very serious, it, it, there's music at funerals too different kind of music. Very important words are spoken. There's deep memories. It's very serious. So each group of kids tried to get the other group of kids to play the game that they wanted. And the only game that they wound up playing was the game of disagreeing. They just kept fighting about which game to play. And the result was they didn't get to play anything. Uh, Jesus always calls us to be childlike. Children are just remarkably candid and transparent. They're, they're, the way they talk, there's an honesty. Uh, sometimes it can be a little embarrassing, but they're very honest. And they're, they're less reserved in their expression of joy. When they're happy, it just shows. Uh, the older we get, we learn to be far more cautious with our words and a lot less restrained in our joy. But Jesus also knew what it was like to be childish. And that's when people can be whiny and uncooperative and act spoiled. And Jesus is calling us to be childlike without being childish. So John the baptizer was like the funeral game guy, very serious guy. He wouldn't eat with anybody. And if you, if you saw what he was eating, you wouldn't want to eat with him either. He, he ate locusts and wild honey, bugs. He would take bugs and dip them in honey. And you could just hear it crunch as he's eating. And like nobody wanted to, to do that. And he kept calling people to repentance. Not a comfortable message to give. And he demanded that they make room for God in their lives. Prepare the way of the Lord is how he would say it. And he, he insisted that they straighten their life out. Make his paths straight is how he would say it. And he reminded people, and this might be interesting for our own generation right now. He reminded people that their ethnicity was not a spiritual advantage. He said, don't assume that because your father is Abraham, that gets you anything, because God can raise up from stones children from Abraham. And he insisted that God was clearing out fruitless lives. 
he, he used this expression, the ax is laid at the fruit of the at, at the root of the tree. And what he was saying is a, a tree that's not bearing fruit is actually taking up ground where there could be fruitfulness, and God's clearing it out. And he did something else which is really strange. He said that his ministry was not complete. He would say that there was one who was coming after him, much greater than he was. He wasn't even worthy to untie his sandals. And he said, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's another who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And, and that would be available to anyone who made themselves available to it. It's a really remarkable message. The Pharisees did not want to play John the Baptizer's game because he was way too serious. Jesus was like the wedding game guy. He would celebrate with anyone and with everyone. He, he called people to repentance too, but the language he used sounded like an opportunity to learn instead of a way to be shamed. And he insisted that God was interested in their life and that he had come to share in their life. Uh, other ideas about God is that he was very separate from life. And he would share the table. Jesus would share the table with anyone. He would talk to everyone. He would laugh often. And the Pharisees didn't want to play his game because they couldn't take him seriously. They just didn't like what he was saying. The problem wasn't the person that God was using. The problem was a built-in resistance that they had. And here's the point I want you to get. The easiest way to resist God, the easiest way to resist God is to find fault with the one that God is using. That's a great temptation. It's so easy to fall into. Now, both Jesus and John called people to repentance. They wanted them to rethink life, rethink their understanding of God, respond to God's agenda for them. Both insisted you need a purpose in life that is worth the very best of you. They insisted on this. The Pharisees thought that the goal, the purpose of the game was the rules. And they didn't understand that there's something more important than the rules you play by. That's why they really struggled with both John and Jesus. Jesus knew his purpose. He came, he said it, right? To seek and save those who are lost. His purpose was great enough to propel him through a garden of betrayal and a courtyard of accusation. He was able to endure the pain of nails and lashes because his purpose was that great. In fact, he said it this way in John 12. He says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason. This is his purpose. This is why I came to this hour. The easiest way to resist God is to find fault with the one that God is using. We do this um, a lot in life, far more than we realize. Uh, I would like to know God better, but, and then there's something to fill that blank in with. I would become a more generous person, but, and we aren't really giving reasons. We're just making excuses. Something in our heart is set to resist the purpose of God in our life. I believe that Christ will become everything to you when you realize he has done everything for you. Let me say that again. Christ will become everything to you once you realize he has done everything for you. You see, we want other people to validate us, to give us some sense of significance. And we keep waiting for that to happen. And by the way, they're waiting for us to validate them too. And by the way, it's not just unbelievers that do this. Christians do this a lot. We play a song to signal what we want other people to do. We kind of send out information. This is how we would like you to respond. And they don't do it. 
Maybe we want, we want them to be sad or frustrated about something or happy about something or joyful about something. We want them to be what we are about something. And they just look at us because there's something they want us to be for them too. And it creates a lot of confusion and quite honestly, some conflict. We want them to be more serious, shed more tears, take this seriously. And it, it seems like they're not buying into it. Or maybe we want them to be more happy, make more promises, eat, drink, dance, come on, get with the program. And it seems like they're not doing it. And lots of times we don't want what they want. But here's the real kicker. Lots of times, we don't know what we want. We just know we don't want that. Whatever it is that's been placed in front of us. And so I think we need to have a better way to think about things than just trying to get people to validate us or trying to make sure we're validating those who are around us. So here's a key that may help unlock some of your own personal self-awareness and I think unlock a door to the purpose of God in our lives too. This is the key. The more purpose I have, the less fault I will find. The more purpose I have, the less fault I will find. If you find yourself being hypercritical, if you find yourself being a little bit judgmental, if you find yourself being frustrated at how people are not doing what they are supposed to be doing, it might be an indicator you have some confusion, a lack of clarity about why you are here. And that can make a huge difference in how we approach life. You see options and opportunities when you have purpose. When you know what your purpose is, you just see everything differently. You have better language. You have pure motives when you have a sense of purpose. Uh, you feel less responsible for how something is going to turn out and you feel more available for what you are willing to invest in. When you have a sense of purpose, it makes a huge difference in our life. So Jesus, Jesus actually started his ministry at a wedding, and he attended several funeral services, although he could be a little bit disruptive in a funeral service. This is interesting, though. Rather than seeing his purpose as an excuse to disengage from life, he actually saw his purpose as a lens through which to see life. It wasn't a reason to not engage. It was clarity on how to engage. So Jesus calls us to seek God's kingdom and God's agenda first. It's not a rule to keep. It's a purpose to live by. Paul put it this way. He said, I want to know Christ in every aspect of life. He wasn't trying to keep a rule. He said, whether it's the good parts or the painful parts, I want to know Christ in all of it. He wasn't keeping a rule. He had a purpose by, he, by which he was living. Jesus is far more interested in what purpose you live for than in what game you play. Let me say that again. Jesus is far more interested in what purpose you live for than in what game you play. So go to weddings, attend funerals, laugh with those who are laughing, weep with those who are weeping. But don't mistake an event for a purpose. How do you show up at the events of your life? It makes a huge difference. I want to know Christ fully. I want to know his capacity to do anything. And I also want to know his capacity to bear anything. I want to know Christ in all of that. I want to live in a way that his presence in me affects my presence with others. That when I walk into the room, that because of a purpose that I have, it makes a difference in the room that I'm in. I want to live with a sense of intentionality, a baseline confidence that God is at work in me and God is at work around me. It's amazing how much freedom and faith will come into your life once you come to realize that. 
I want to be the kind of person who can grieve with those who suffer and the kind of person who still hopes for better things. I don't want to be the kind of person who's only known for finding a reason to disagree with anyone or disengage from anything. That will not help our world. I will not discover my purpose pursuing a life like that. You are a child of God. And deep within you is a purpose that can orient your life in the direction you are intended to go and can ground your life when the storms of life rage against you. The truth is, following God doesn't exempt you from life. I know some people think it does. It's not true. So when those times come and you're not sure which way is forward, and when the burdens seem great enough, you don't know if you have enough strength to go on, or when it feels like the ground has been pulled from under your feet, what I want you to know is that none of that has determined the purpose of God. It's actually the purpose of God that will give you the direction to go and something to stand on. Let's pray. Uh, Father, it's so easy to get caught up in, in playing games and in finding fault and in finding reasons not to take next steps. Would you help us today to recognize that you have invested into the very core of our being a purpose, an intention, a reason for our being here? Until we know it, we're just wandering. And once we know it, it makes all the difference in the world. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.